This is the Chris Berry Show. Expert information on elder law, retirement, and estate planning. Information that you can understand. Here's your host, Chris Berry. Hello, welcome to the Chris Berry Show. This is Chris Berry, where we talk about wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. And you're listening to FM 101.5 AM 1400, The Patriot. So thank you again for joining us this week. Uh, If you listened to us last week, we discussed some of the common estate planning mistakes that we see in our office. And we started with uh, the first five estate planning mistakes. And uh, this week, we plan on wrapping out the, the top 10 estate planning mistakes with mistakes 6 through 10. And mistakes 6 through 10 are going to include things like not funding your trust if you've created a, a revocable living trust, not having your documents reviewed on a regular basis, and on and on. So we'll talk about those in the second segment. But in this first segment, one of the things that I like to do is I want to talk to you about uh, just what happened in the past week. And so one of the things that my family does whenever we sit down for a dinner a meal is we we talk about a positive focus. So something to start that meal off or even when I'm uh, at work, we start our meetings off with a positive focus. And I wanted to do the same thing here on the Chris Berry Show to start off with a positive focus for the week. And so for me, uh, this last week, one of the exciting things is I took a trip to Chicago. So I go there about once a quarter and I go to a program It's called Strategic Coach. And what Strategic Coach is is a program where other attorneys and financial planners and CPAs and other business owners, uh, we sit in a room together for a day and we talk about what's going on in our practices. We talk about where things are going uh, in the future. And so it's something that I've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it's been very positive, had a positive uh, effect on the strategies we're able to offer our clients, a positive effect on how we run a practice. And so I just got back from Strategic Coach, and I thought I'd share some of the things that I learned or some of the concepts that I've picked up from Strategic Coach. So my positive focus this week uh, is is uh, taking time out of uh, the practice for a day, day and a half to really focus on sharpening the saw, so to speak. And so one of the things that I, I've learned from Strategic Coach is this concept of a positive focus. And so, like I said, we start our weekly team meetings off with a positive focus. Uh, Even when I sit down for dinner with my family, we start off with a positive focus for the day. So my wife will uh, share something, and and my son Ryan, who's seven, he'll share something that happened uh, at his second grade or maybe something that happened on the bus. And uh, my daughter Madison, who's age five, uh, she's in Montessori school right now, Uh, She'll share something exciting about one of her works or maybe what she did during uh, recess or or playtime. It's just a good way to kind of get things started off in the right direction. And so uh, what I wanted to share was a couple of things I've learned through Strategic Coach through the previous uh, couple years of being a part of it. uh, Because I think it's important to continue to grow and, and be educated, both in terms of just who I am as a person, but also the strategies that we're able to offer our clients. And one of those uh, things that I learned from a strategic coach was this concept of the lifetime expander. So it has an interesting effect both uh, personally as well as professionally when dealing with my clients. And it really has an interesting effect in terms of planning for the second half of life. So the concept behind this is that everyone kind of has a number in their head of, you know what, this is how long I'm going to live. And whether that number is 84 or 75 or, or uh, for me, it's actually 148. So I plan on living 148. And you might be thinking, you know what, Chris, that sounds crazy. That's ludicrous. What are you talking about? Well, let's kind of break this down a little bit. And there's really two aspects of this that I, I think is important to understand. And the first aspect, and this is something that I've seen with my clients, is that when you're going into retirement and you're going into aging, it's important to have something that you're looking forward to. So if if you're nearing retirement, it's important not just to retire from something or retire from a job. It's important to retire to something. Uh, For example, uh, I have some clients who... One of the things that they're passionate about is they take a mission trip to Haiti every year. So they spend a lot of time 
volunteering their time in, in Haiti. And that's really a passion project for them. And when we meet on a regular basis and we sit down and talk about what's new uh, in their world or what's new in the financial and legal world, I'm always excited to hear about uh, the latest happenings from their trip. And you can tell that it's something that energizes them and they look forward to it every year. And so you can see the energy that they have. So I think that positive mindset that always have something that you're looking forward to, it's important to, to have that growth mentality. Uh, even as you're, you're, you're going through the second half of life, even after you've retired, what are the things that excite you? What does retirement look, for you, look like for you? What does that second half of life look for you? So if I were to ask you a question of, well, let's say you do have that number in your head, whether it's uh, 85 or 95 or, or, or uh, 105, whatever that number is, what if the day before that date, what if you were able to do all the things that you wanted to do? What if you were able to have the, the mental agility, the physical agility, to be able to, to walk around or, or ride a bike or play with your grandkids or great-great-grandkids? Uh, what if you're able to do that at that age? Wouldn't you want to experience more of that? And so the idea is that we have something that we're looking forward to, something that excites us. And then you couple that with the second thing that's important with regards to this discussion and why my number is 148. And what that is, is that with medical technologies continually advancing, uh, I think that within the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, we're going to see some amazing medical enhancements. Uh, so right now we have things like colloquial ear implants, where if you couldn't hear before, now you can hear. Uh, with some of the injections and surgeries and hip replacements and knee replacements that they can do. Uh, we might be turning into the uh, bionic man, but with medical technologies constantly advancing, I think it's going to have an amazing uh, effect on our longevity. So a lot of people think, you know, I don't want to be run down and my body giving out. Well, I think with a lot of medical technologies coming about, that we'll be able to do a, a much better job of, of keeping the body going and even, even keeping the mind going. So you couple those two concepts together of always having something to look forward to, having that growth mindset. You couple that with the medical advances and medical technologies that people a lot smarter than me uh, are putting their effort into uh, these life-enhancing uh, uh, technologies. I think we're going to live a lot longer than we have in the past. And so personally for me, uh, when I first heard this concept, it, it really opened my mind to this idea. And uh, how I came to the 148 is uh, when I heard that, uh, I didn't want to think of myself as middle age. So that was my quarter age. So uh, that, that's my goal. Right now I'm a, just a little bit over quarter age, but I plan on living to 148. So that's, it's going to put my, uh, my middle age a number of years uh, down the line for me. Uh, and I know it kind of sounds silly, but you have to take those two things into account, that growth mindset along with the increases in, in medical technology. Now, professionally and how that affects my clients, it becomes interesting in a number of different ways. Because now, and we talk about this on the Chris Berry Show, we talk about planning for the second half of life. So planning after retirement. Well, that second half of life might look a lot longer than it did in the past. So we need to make sure that we're going to uh, have a plan to make sure that our money lasts as long as we do. And for me, living to 148, I need to make sure that my money lasts to 148. And so we need to think about how we handle our investments, how do we protect ourselves from long-term care costs to ensure that our, our money lasts as long as, as we do. And, and we have a variety of strategies uh, available to ensure that those types of things happen. And that's one of the things that we educate our clients on uh, on a regular basis and why we host uh, regular workshops at one of our different locations, uh, whether it's in Brighton, Novi, Livonia, or Bloomfield Hills. In fact, uh, this week alone, we've hosted uh, four different workshops on a variety of different topics. And if you want to learn more about those workshops that are free to the public that we host on a regular basis, you can always go to uh, our website, The Chris Berry Show. So T-H-E-C-H-R-I-S-B as in boy, E-R-R-Y, show.com. So thechrisberryshow.com. Or you can call us and leave a message and we'll follow up to get you scheduled in one of our workshops. 
And our phone number is 810-355-2584. Or you can always ask us a, a question by shooting us an email. So at any time, shoot us an email at askchris at com, And we can send you a schedule of our upcoming workshops. Or, you know what, if you do have a question that you want us to answer on air, uh, we do that in our third segment. So I'm going to read some of the questions that have already been submitted, either through our uh, phone number or through uh, our email. So again, that email is askchris at thechrisberryshow.com. And uh, we'll read some of those questions each week uh, on our show. And we'll provide some of the answers uh, each week as well. And again, you're listening to The Chris Berry Show. And we host the show uh, every Sunday at 2 p.m. on FM 101.5 and 1400 The Patriot. And also, you can download us and listen to us at any time via podcast, uh, whether on iTunes or uh, by going to thechrisberryshow.com. So... I was talking about that positive focus of uh, just getting back from strategic coach. And every quarter, it really energizes me. I, I rub shoulders with some of the top financial planners and attorneys in the nation. We have a chance to uh, not only share our experiences, but also uh, one of the things is, is that we do get coaching from uh, someone who's uh, been in the business. And so that's something that's really important to understand is even the best in the world, they always have coaches. So the Michael Jordans of the world, uh, I grew up as a huge Michael Jordan fan. Uh, I just uh, loved his competitive nature. Well, Michael Jordan had a coach. Tiger Woods, when he was at the top of the game of golfing, uh, he also had a coach. And I think it's important to understand that the best of the best, they, they always want to strive to get better. And so it's important for me to try to improve uh, the way that I service my clients but also, I think it's important from a, a client perspective uh, because a lot, I see a lot of uh, questions or I see some people, especially our engineering clients, they want to try to maybe do it themselves. Uh, and I view my role as a coach and an educator. So it's, it's great to uh, be educated and, and try to do it yourself, but sometimes you need that second opinion or sometimes you need to seek out the counsel of an expert or, or seek some coaching. And that's really why we provide so much education to the public is we want to provide as much information as possible. And so that's why we do our weekly workshops. That was one of the main reasons that I wanted to start this uh, weekly radio show is to really, truly uh, disseminate this important information surrounding uh, financial, legal, and tax planning. So if you're one of those people that's kind of a do-it-yourselfer, but you want a second opinion uh, on that estate plan or that retirement plan, uh, feel free to give us a call at, at any time at 810-355-2584. Because a lot of times it's important to get a second opinion to make sure that uh, you're doing things the way you're supposed to. For example, I, I have this great client. We put together a estate plan for him uh, recently, and I'm not going to divulge any client names because of course, we have uh, attorney-client privilege. But we were talking about, uh, well, we set up a trust, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we provided for the spouse. So if uh, the husband were to pass away, make sure the IRAs go to that surviving spouse. But then one of the interesting things that we did is we wanted to ensure that if both uh, husband and wife passed away, uh, we set up a trust to ensure that their sizable uh, IRA accounts, their pre-tax accounts, would go to the kids, uh, but they wouldn't have to pay all the income tax uh, right away, that they'd be able to stretch it out over the children's lifetime. Because if you have these pre-tax accounts, you have these things called required minimum distributions, that a at age 70 and a half, you have to start taking out your required minimum distributions, meaning uh, you can't defer paying taxes uh, forever. Uncle Sam wants their piece. And then what happens is when uh, you pass away and you leave it to the next generation, then the next generation, uh, no matter what their age is, they have to start taking out the required minimum distributions as well based on their age. And so um, my client, who is an engineer, uh, had this uh, very complicated spreadsheet. And we're going over a discussion, or, or he was asking me, and we were talking about how best, uh, given this new tax structure that we have, thanks to uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, tax plan, what would be the best way to handle uh, those that pre-tax money? 
And so one of the things I suggested to him was that why don't we look at paying the income tax sooner rather than later? Because a lot of my clients and a lot of experts think that taxes are going to go up in the future. And that's the way that the tax plan is written as of right now. And, and he insisted to me and he pointed to his, uh, he said he had an Excel spreadsheet at home demonstrating this, that, you know what, Chris, if I want to maximize the value of the IRAs and, and the and the length that the IRAs will pay out, it's going to make more sense to continue to defer paying taxes, even if taxes are going to go up in the future. Uh, and and I, I told him, I was like, I just don't think that's the case. In fact, I have some numbers to, to back up that uh, my position. And so I told him, you know what? Hey, let, let me take a second uh, look at that. Let me take a look at your uh, spreadsheet and see if I can see any holes. And lo and behold, we did find uh, that there's some variables that he didn't take into account. And it turned out that uh, with that second opinion, he was much better off paying the income tax now versus later. And it just shows you the value of a second opinion. So, uh, and that's why I think uh, having a coach is important because it can provide you that second opinion. So if you want a second opinion from uh, an attorney and planner, uh, give us a call at 810-355-2584. Again, this is Chris Berry, uh, host of The Chris Berry Show, coming to you every Sunday at 2 p.m. on FM 101.5 AM 1400, The Patriot. And I invite you to join us in this next segment where we're going to continue talking about 10 of the worst estate planning mistakes we see in our office. I'll see you after the break. Thank you very much. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the elder care firm, like Sherry Skelton and her family did from Fenton. My mother has Alzheimer's. My mom just had a regular will. She didn't have anything set up in a trust. And Chris set up a brand new will and he got everything rolling. Chris has been extremely helpful. My mom would never have gotten my dad's VA benefits if it wasn't for them. Lori, who actually did a lot of the paperwork for the VA, she was like my new best friend. I talked to her probably two, three times a week, and we would be on hold together while we were waiting for the VA to pick up. Uh, we were approved, and we would never would have been able to do that if it wasn't for them. I can't even begin to tell you what he did for my family. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. Welcome back to the Chris Berry Show. This is Chris Berry, where we talk about wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. And now what I want to do is follow up on our last episode. Our last episode, we started talking about the 10 worst estate planning mistakes that we see in our office. And we've been doing this for over 13 years in Metro Detroit. So we've seen a lot of good things. We've seen a lot of bad things. So what we're going to talk about today is avoiding some of those bad things. And so last week, we started off with our first five estate planning mistakes, and the first five estate planning mistakes started off with number one, dying in testate, meaning dying without a will, without a trust, where your assets go into probate court. It's time consuming. It's costly. It's public. Everyone wants to avoid probate, right? And we don't want to leave it up to the state or the courts to decide the fates of our stuff as it goes to our loved ones. So we know dying in testate, that's a big no-no. Then our second big no-no was having a simple I love you will. So a simple I love you will is that will that says, well, if I pass away, it goes to my, my spouse and then my kids. Well, what's the problem with this, you might be asking? Well, the problem is, is that a will does not avoid probate. Again, a will does not avoid probate. All that a will does is gives instructions to probate court on how to administer your estate. So if you're looking to avoid probate, having a simple I love you will probably is not the answer. And that brings us to our third estate planning mistake, and we covered this in more detail in the last episode, so feel free to download that podcast if you haven't. But our third mistake was giving property outright, uh, whether through uh, gifting, which I'm not a huge fan of because you're giving up control, and if you're concerned about long-term care costs, they can come back after you for those gifts, uh, or giving outright as part of 
an estate plan or through beneficiary designations. See, the problem with this is you're just handing a pillowcase of money to that next generation. And that could be a, a bad idea if they're minors or financially immature. And that also could be a bad idea because what happens if after you pass away and you've given it to them outright, they go through a divorce, a lawsuit, creditor action, bankruptcy, or even they pass away. That money could end up outside of the family. So giving property outright, probably not the best way to do things. That's mistake number three. And then mistake number four, if you remember from last week and you're listening, was owning property jointly with someone other than a spouse. Uh, and the problem here is if you name one of the kids joint to a piece of property, or if you were to name a kid jointly to uh, uh, your bank account, you're opening yourself up to all the potential liabilities of that person. So if they were to get sued, well, now you might lose your house because of that. So there's always a better way. So joint ownership between a married couple, great. Joint ownership between anyone else, probably not the best idea. And that brings us to estate planning mistake number five that we talked about. And this was, uh, again, from last week. We talked about not having a trust. So not everyone needs a trust, but a trust can be a great way to avoid probate. could be a great way to control that distribution, protect your beneficiaries upon death, uh, and then also a great way to protect your assets, protect them from uh, creditors, uh, protect them from long-term care costs or, or any type of spend down. So those were the first five estate planning mistakes, uh, and five out of the ten uh, worst estate planning mistakes that we've seen in our office in, in the past 13 years. And if you want more information on that, feel free to go to uh, thechrisberryshow.com, and you can download that last uh, podcast where we discussed in more detail the first five estate planning mistakes. So now what I want to do for, for this segment is wrap up those 10 estate planning mistakes. So we already covered one through five. This is going to bring us to number six. And number six, or the sixth worst estate planning mistake, is if you do have a trust, not funding your trust properly. So think of a trust kind of like a suitcase where you need to put things into the suitcase. Uh, while you're alive and well, you're the one holding on to the suitcase. And then if you were to pass away, you pass that suitcase on to your successor trustee who then distributes it to the beneficiaries. Well, the problem here is, is what if you haven't put anything into that suitcase? Then all you're doing is passing an empty suitcase to the next generation. And now your loved ones might have to go to probate court to uh, get those assets out of your name and, and transfer it to wherever they, they're supposed to go. Because if you remember, we talked about there's four ways assets uh, can transfer out of your name upon death. And the first way is through joint ownership, which is great for a married couple. Second would be through beneficiary designations, but you have that pillowcase of money approach where that money might be lost in a, a divorce or a creditor action. Third, we have a trust, and I think that's one of the best ways to pass assets. But if an asset doesn't pass through joint ownership, beneficiary designation trust, then it ends up going into probate. And we know that we want to try to avoid that. So getting to not funding your trust Again, the different assets you own, they need to point to the trust. So if you have a home, if you have a checking account, if you have a, a life insurance policy, you should be pointing to the trust one way or another through beneficiary designation changes or through changes of ownership or, or if it's real estate, making sure that the deed says it goes to the trust either immediately or upon death. And we see a lot of people that they set up an estate plan uh, a number of years ago, but their trust isn't funded properly. So now you might have spent $3,000 on a trust. Now your family is going to have to spend $5,000 on a probate. So funding a trust, it's vitally important. It's something that we uh, take seriously at our office and we do for our clients. So that was mistake number six, estate planning mistake number six, not funding a trust. That brings us to mistake number seven. So estate planning mistake number seven is not having your documents reviewed. So one of the things that's just the nature of life is that things change. Your, your family situation might change. Your assets might change. The, the laws are always changing. The tax laws just changed. And because of all these changes, you need to think about making sure that your estate plan is updated for these changes. And this goes really for everything, whether it's your estate plan, your financial plan, your tax plan. 
things are always changing. So it's important to have it reviewed and important to have it reviewed by a professional. And so think of an estate plan kind of like a parachute. You never know when you're going to need it, but you're going to want to make sure that you don't have any holes in that parachute when you jump. Similarly, you're not going to know when you're going to have to rely on that estate plan. You never know when life's going to throw you a curveball. But if they do, or if life does throw you a curveball, it's important that that parachute doesn't have any holes in it. It's important that that estate plan is is updated for the changes in law. Uh, We'll make sure that we have the right people named in the right positions. And like we talked in the last mistake, make sure that we have everything funded correctly into the trust. So, we recommend that you review your estate plan on an annual basis. I know it's not fun to think about, but it's important because you never know when you're going to need it. So mistake number uh, seven, not having your estate plan reviewed on a regular basis. And that brings us to mistake number eight. So estate planning mistake number eight. And estate planning mistake number eight is not having a plan for what happens if you don't die. Now, that sounds kind of silly, I I know. But what we're talking about here is the concept of of elder law. So most people are familiar with estate planning. Estate planning is planning for what happens if you pass away. Well, elder law is planning for what happens if you don't. You continue to age and you face all the issues that go along with aging. And so we take a look at both sides of the coin when it comes to putting together an estate plan. So it's important to figure out where your stuff goes when you pass away, but also we need to plan for what happens if you don't. What happens if you live to 148, like we were talking about in the last segment, right? So it's important to have things like powers of attorney, and it's also important to take into account things like long-term care costs. So what are the things that we can do to help pay that devastating cost of long-term care? And really, we need to understand that there's six ways to pay for long-term care. So we can private pay. Uh, pay out of our own funds. Uh, We can have the kids pay. A lot of times we don't want to rely on that, but sometimes they pay uh, not with their money, but in terms of their time. Third way is we can have long-term care insurance. And there's two forms of long-term care insurance. There's the pure traditional long-term care insurance where you might be paying on it for 20 years and then all of a sudden the premiums increase on you. And then we also have a new form of long-term care called asset-based long-term care. And this is a route that a lot of my clients uh, are looking at. And if you want, uh, we actually have a short little video course talking about some ways that we can help pay for long-term care using asset-based long-term care. And you can uh, watch that video course by going to uh, cjberry, B-E-R-R-Y, group, so cjberrygroup.net. And you can uh, watch uh, three short uh, eight-minute videos talking about how to use asset-based long-term care to leverage your assets to protect against the devastating cost of long-term care. So uh, the fourth way we can pay for long-term care is Medicare, but really that pays for short-term rehab as well as hospice. So that's not really a a payer of long-term care. And then fifth, we have the VA benefit, where if you're a veteran or surviving spouse of a veteran, We could bring in an extra $1,000 to $2,000 a month to help pay for home care or assisted living. And then the sixth way to pay for long-term care if you need nursing home care would be Medicaid. So it's important to take this into account when you're, you're setting up your estate is that there's some things from a legal and financial standpoint we can take into account to ensure that your money lasts as long as you do and that if you do need long-term care, especially if you're a married couple, to ensure that if one spouse needs long-term care, that healthy spouse isn't completely impoverished paying for it. So that's number eight in terms of estate planning mistakes, not planning for what happens if you don't die. And that brings us to estate planning mistake number nine. And estate planning mistake number nine is thinking that a trust alone is enough. Now, a lot of times a trust, whether it's a a living trust or a castle trust, which is a form of asset protection trust, a lot of times the trust is really the focal point of the estate plan, but it's not the whole estate plan. There's other ancillary documents or other documents that are a key component of any comprehensive estate plan. So in addition to the trust, a lot of times when we're putting together a comprehensive estate plan, we'll also have what we call a pour-over will. 
a pour over will. And what a pour over will is, is a document or like a last will and testament that says if any assets do end up in probate, they end up getting knocked into the trust. So they still go where they're supposed to go. Now you do have to go through probate to get there, but it's like a spare tire. It's there just in case. We don't want to rely on it, but it's important to have. So in addition to the trust and the will, also as part of a comprehensive estate plan, we want to have a financial power of attorney. And a financial power of attorney is a document that if you get a knock in your head, who's going to make financial decisions for you? And a lot of times it might be spouse first, then maybe children, but it needs to be in writing. So we need to know that who's going to pay the bills uh, if you're unable to do so. So in addition to the financial power of attorney, we also have the medical power of attorney. And the medical power of attorney is a document that appoints someone to make medical decisions if you're unable to. Uh, in Michigan, we call this a patient advocate designation. So if you're in a car accident, who's going to make medical decisions for you, uh, including your decisions with regards to life support? So you might be familiar with Terry Schiavo. She was a woman down in Florida. She was in a vegetative state. Her husband wanted to remove her from life support. Her family wanted her to remain on life support. And it became a big court battle that lasted over eight years. All of that can be could have been avoided had Terry Schiavo had a medical power of attorney outlining what her end-of-life decision-making is, uh, regardless of what that decision is. It just needs to be in writing, and so that's what we do in that medical power of attorney. So in addition to the trust and the will and the financial power of attorney and the medical power of attorney, also we need to have, and this applies if you have real estate, we need to do some type of deed some type of deed saying that if you were to pass away or it goes into your trust, or maybe we need to deed that property directly to the trust. So a lot of times we might use something called a ladybird deed. And a ladybird deed, it's basically a beneficiary designation for your home. that says it's in your name while you're alive. Uh, if you were to pass away, it avoids probate and goes to whoever you've named as a beneficiary, whether it's a trust or, or whether it's your, your children. And a ladybird deed is a great way to transfer uh, pro, uh, to transfer real estate to avoid probate. So as part of that comprehensive estate plan, uh, you want to have a trust a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times you do, uh, a will, a financial power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, and then if you own real estate, uh, you also want to have a deed. And then the last part of, of those other documents, a lot of times we want to have some type of final expense trust. Make sure that we have a plan for final expenses so that you're not leaving it to the children. So as you see, there's a lot more that goes into a comprehensive estate plan than just uh, uh, mistake number nine, thinking that a trust alone is enough. And the 10th problem or the 10th estate planning mistake is not understanding that the biggest problem is not the IRS, it's not probate, it's not long-term care cost, it's ourselves. And it comes down to a procrastination. It's not fun to think about death and taxes and capacity, but it's all something that we need to take into account. And it's very easy to procrastinate on, but it's something that's important to handle because you never know when life's going to throw you a curveball. So with that, that's the 10 estate planning mistakes. I'll summarize those again in our next segment. Uh, but if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to email us at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com. Give us a call at 810-355-2584. And join us every Sunday at 2 p.m. on FM 101.5 AM 1400, The Patriot, on The Chris Berry Show, where we talk about legal wealth, and tax planning for the second half of life. Now join us for our next segment where we wrap this up and answer your questions. Thank you. The cost of long-term care can be overwhelming. If you're dealing with long-term care costs, make plans to attend the next free informative workshop from the Elder Care Firm in Brighton. They'll show you how to protect your hard-earned assets and obtain the governmental benefits you deserve, including veterans' benefits and Medicaid. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. As the only certified elder law attorney in Livingston County, I have the knowledge and estate planning strategies to help you. When you call, reserve your seat at our next workshop or schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Spots are filling up for the next free Elder Care Firm workshop. Reserve your seat today by calling 810-214-3800 or visit theeldercarefirm.com. The Elder Care Firm also invites you to join them at this year's Walk to End Alzheimer's. The Remembrance Night is on September 20th, and the walk is on Saturday, October 1st in downtown Brighton. Call 810 214 
3800 today. Welcome back to the Chris Berry Show. This is Chris Berry, where we talk about wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. You're listening to FM 101.5, AM 1400, The Patriot. So uh, now this section, what we're going to do is I want to just kind of cover those 10 estate planning mistakes in more detail. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get to answering your question. So uh, every week uh, we, we get questions submitted at askchris at com, or people give us a call at 810-355-2584, uh, leaving us some questions they have. And we select some of those questions or, or get back to uh, the, those requests. But we read some of those questions on air. We think uh, of the ones uh, that I, I think are, are good to share. Now, before getting to the questions uh, for this week, what I want to do is uh, just summarize those 10 uh, gruesome estate planning mistakes. And one through 10 in no particular order, the first mistake we have is dying intestate, so dying without doing any type of will or a trust. The second big mistake is having that simple I love you will that sends your loved ones to a probate court. A third big mistake uh, giving property outright, whether while you're alive or even through a trust or a will. Uh, we call that that pillowcase of money approach that we want to try to avoid. Number four, owning property jointly with other, someone other than a spouse. Uh, we talked about how that could uh, end up uh, with some bad news, especially if something happens to one of those people that have been named jointly on the account. Number five, not having a trust. Now, not everyone needs a trust, but for a lot of reasons, trust makes sense. Uh, if you want to avoid probate, if you want to control the distribution upon death, and then if you want to uh, build in some asset protection, a lot of times a trust is the best route to go. Number six, if you do have a trust, uh, not funding the trust properly. Remember, a trust, it's kind of like a suitcase. We need to make sure that there's stuff in that suitcase that we're passing on to a successor trustee. Number seven, not having your documents reviewed on a regular basis, and this goes for a estate plan or a financial plan or even your tax plan, should be reviewed by a professional. Uh, and again, we talked about uh, at the top of the show how having a second, uh, second set of eyes can be helpful. And sometimes that second set of eyes or that coach uh, or that teacher can, can help shed some light on your situation. So that's number seven. Number eight brings us to not planning for what happens if you don't die. So remember, uh, basic estate planning is just planning for what happens if you die, but we also need to take into account what happens if you don't and you continue to live and you face all the issues that go along with that. And that brings us to mistake estate planning mistake number nine, thinking that a trust alone is enough. Remember, there's more that goes into a comprehensive estate plan than just having a trust. And then number 10, the mistake, or the tenth mistake, is uh, thinking the enemy is, is the IRS or uh, long-term care costs or, or the evils of probate. Those are all things that we want to try to avoid, but the real enemy tends to be us, uh, and we see it in the form of procrastination. Uh, estate planning—it's one of those things that seems like it's easy to put off, not that exciting. Rather, spend the money on maybe a new deck, or especially as we're going into summer, and that seems fun. But uh, sometimes we need to. Uh, take care of our responsibilities. And that's where uh, putting together that estate plan or having it reviewed or revisiting it can, can be key. So with that, I, I hope that you avoid some of those estate planning mistakes. And, and if you want your situation uh, reviewed, uh, feel free to give us a call at 810-355-2584, where you can sign up for one of our free workshops going on throughout Metro Detroit uh, to learn uh, some of the other things to consider when it comes to reviewing your estate. And we do these workshops about once a week uh, because we like providing education uh, to our, our family, friends, and, and clients. And that's one of the reasons that we started The Chris Berry Show, is to disseminate this important information on uh, wealth, estate, and tax planning. And so now I want to switch gears a little bit and get into answering some of the questions that have been submitted over the last week or two, uh, either through our email at askchris at com, or you can give us a call and leave a message or leave a question for us that we'll, we'll try to get a chance to read. Uh, give us a call anytime at 810 now, as I get into reading these questions, remember, even though I'm an attorney and a, a planner and uh, and have my credentials and am a professional, uh, make sure to visit a professional. This isn't uh, uh, legal advice, even though I am an attorney. So take it for what it's uh, worth here. 
So the first question uh, submitted, and I appreciate uh, the question submitted each week, uh, gives us a chance to share it with our listeners. Uh, The first question here is, can I buy my father's uh, house uh, for $1 uh, six months before he goes into a nursing home? And so this was submitted by Fred. So it looks like Fred's father is going into a nursing home and... uh, and when you go into a nursing home, the cost can be just devastating, anywhere from eight to ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars. Uh, in fact, I was meeting with a client uh, a couple of weeks ago. His mom was in a nursing home paying four hundred and fifty dollars per day, which comes out to be about thirteen thousand five hundred dollars per month. Which I don't care how much money you have, that's going to put a, a devastating effect on, on that nest egg. So Fred's question is: Can I buy my father's? house for one dollar six months before he goes into the nursing home well unfortunately fred i'm going to have to give you the lawyer answer and this is what we learned in our first year of law school to answer any question with it depends because it makes us sound smart as lawyers and unfortunately sometimes it does depend so if your dad is going into a nursing home and he's planning on private paying or has long-term care to help uh, pay for that with his social security or any pension and he can pay that twelve thousand dollars a month then I see no problem buying the house for less than fair market value. But I don't think that's what Fred's really getting to with this question. I think what Fred is insinuating that he thinks his father might need Medicaid. And Medicaid, to qualify for Medicaid, a single individual can only have $2,000 worth of countable assets. Uh, A married couple, they're going to make you cut your assets in half. At most, they're going to allow you to have $120,000 worth of countable assets. So a lot of times people will try to give away assets or spend down uh, to get qualified for Medicaid. So unfortunately, Medicaid has a look-back period where they look back five years to see if you've made any gifts. And so I think that's what we're trying to get around right here is that Fred thinks that he can buy the house for a dollar and it's not going to qualify as a gift. Well, that's true. But unfortunately, the way Medicaid looks at it is that if you do sell a property or, or sell an asset, uh, it needs to be sold for fair market value. And I'm guessing in this situation, Fred, that uh, the house is valued at probably more than a dollar. And so what the Medicaid would do in this situation is they'd say, okay, well, sure, you can do that. But what they're going to take into account is, is the fair market value of the house. And that could be established through either two times the state equalized value or you could have a, a realtor uh, run some comps and, and do an assessment, uh, pay some money to get actual assessments uh, for that fair market value. So if the home was valued at $100,000 and you, you bought it for a dollar, Medicaid unfortunately is going to say that that's a, a divestment uh, of $99,000. And what they're going to do is they're going to penalize your dad and he's not going to qualify for Medicaid. Now, there's some options still available for Fred. So one of the things that we could do is understand that the home actually is an exempt asset for Medicaid purposes, where as long as, as Fred's father is alive and his name is on the home, they can't take the home while, while Fred's father is alive. So the home is exempt while you're alive. But the thing that uh, has changed is since 2011, Michigan has had a state recovery where the state of Michigan places a lien on the home uh, to recover whatever the state of Michigan paid out in benefits if the home ends up in probate. So an option here might be to do what's called a ladybird deed. A ladybird deed. And what that is is a, a form of, of ownership where it's still in dad's name while he's alive, but then if he passes away, it avoids probate and therefore avoids the state recovery. So it could go to Fred upon death. And so that would be a way that we could protect that home for that next generation to ensure that Medicaid doesn't take the home while he's alive, ensure that we don't have a divestment penalty and that Fred's father is is penalized. So I hope that was helpful, Fred. Now, see, the interesting thing is a lot of times these seem like very simple questions. It was a a one-line question that Fred uh, sent in to us, but uh, we had to kind of go through the the depends, the if this uh, and then that. And that's why all of this can be a little bit confusing and overwhelming. So that's why it's important to work with a professional, get a second set of eyes, uh, get that coach to help you walk through some of these hidden pitfalls that you might not be expecting. So I hope that was helpful for you, Fred. And with that, we'll move on to uh, the second question here. 
And so the second question, uh, it's from James. So when my wife goes into a nursing home, am I responsible for her bills? James writes. Uh, James then uh, kind of finishes, uh, gives some backstory and lets us know that his wife unfortunately has Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's can be a, a really... A devastating disease. And so uh, one of the things we do is we raise a lot of funds for the, the walk to end Alzheimer's where uh, last year we raised over $11,000 as a team and over a hundred thousand dollars as a, as a walk to help fight Alzheimer's. So I understand where you're at with this, James. So, so the question is when my wife goes in a nursing home, am I responsible for her bills? Um, well, to kind of flesh this out a little bit with regards to just her regular bills. Yeah. You're going to be on the hook for that as well as your wife. But I think we're getting to, do I have to pay for my wife's nursing home care? Uh, and the answer again, I'm going to have to go back to that lawyer answer of it depends. Um, there's some things that you can do to try to protect your resources. Uh, in fact, uh, I actually wrote a book that talked about this very situation. It's called The Caregiver's Legal Guide to Planning for a Loved One with Chronic Illness. And you can get on Amazon uh, if you want to Google that. And it's about $15. Uh, and you can get some more information on that at our website. Uh, if you go to the com, there'll be a link where you can uh, purchase that book. Uh, and I talk about the example. Uh, I had some clients, and I, again, I changed their names. Their names were... Were Bill and Judy, and and one spouse needed long term care, and, and and the other spouse was healthy, and and the spouse that was healthy was concerned of how 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 she was going to pay for Bill's care, uh, and so that yeah, there are some things we can do, James, uh, to try to protect those resources for you, so that uh, you don't have to spend everything down. Now, uh, the default rule, the kind of do nothing plan, is they're going to say that you're going to have to cut your your assets in half. Um, uh, to potentially qualify for Medicaid to, so that the wife, uh, her care will be covered by Medicaid. But there's some things we can do to protect those resources. So uh, give us a call at 810-355-2584. Maybe attend one of our uh, workshops where we talk about this, uh, or, or it might be time to set up an appointment with an elder law attorney. So I hope that was helpful, James. There are some things that are available. Now let's go to our next question. Our next question is submitted by Wilson. So Wilson asks us, if a co-owner on my dad's stock refuses to sign the paper to remove herself, what can my dad do to get her off? My dad is 94 and the stock has always been in his name. Somehow my sister got my dad to put her on as a co-owner. He's very mad about it and wants it back in his name only. If she refuses to sign the paper, uh, if she refuses to sign the paper to remove herself, what can he do to get it back in only his name like it was originally? Well, unfortunately, this sounds like one of the estate planning mistakes we talked about, joint ownership. When you name someone jointly to an account, they become an owner of it and they have a say as well. So they're in control of the situation as well as you are. So unfortunately, if, if uh, Wilson's father uh, wanted to take uh, Wilson's sister off of that property or off of that stock certificate, the sister would have to sign off. The only other remedy in that situation would have to go to court. But unfortunately, Dad, I guess at some point, voluntarily put uh, his daughter jointly on that stock. And when you name someone jointly to an account or an asset, well, they become an owner and they have a say. So unless you, you want to take a trip to court, really the only way, and that's going to be the only way to, to get the sister off of that asset. So unfortunately, I, I wish I had a better answer. Uh, that's not one of those it depends questions. Uh, if sister's not going to sign off of it, then the only option left is to, to go to court, unfortunately. And that's something you might want to hire an attorney to do. Uh, it's not uh, not really within our wheelhouse. We try to keep people out of court, uh, but that might be your only remedy is to go to court. And so then you have to decide what was the value of the stock and is it worth it to, to do so. So uh, I wish I had some better news for you, Wilson, but that's that's probably the the best route. And hopefully it can work it out in, inside of the family. So it's one of those things that uh, I'm only a child. Uh, I'm, I'm an only child. So uh, some of these family dynamic issues I don't have to deal with 
But uh, I'm either the the golden child or the black sheep of the family, depending on the day. So, so with that, we'll go to question number four, and this is submitted by Kelly. So Kelly asks, does an executor need to disclose how money is being spent? My mother had a stroke, but is cognitive and alert. She's in rehab. My brother has taken over as executor to pay bills as one of eight siblings. Holy cow, she has eight siblings. Uh, more than one starts to stress me out. Uh, I have two, and before I had two kids, I didn't have any gray hair. Uh, but as of one of eight siblings, I've asked several times how the bills are being paid. Do we have the right to know how the bills are paid? Well, see, in this situation, Kelly, uh, one of the things is we need to be clear with with the roles. So the role of an executor doesn't really kick in until someone passes away. So most likely they're operating as a power of attorney. And a lot of times there might be one power of attorney followed by successors, and the successor can't act until something happens to that initial power of attorney. So unfortunately in this situation, you don't necessarily have a right to see how things are being handled. And so that initial power of attorney is in control. So uh, that, that's uh, the best answer I can give to you. So I appreciate everyone that submitted questions. If you do have questions, submit them to Ask Chris at the Chris Berry Show. And I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to us this week. My name is Chris Berry. I want to make sure that you have a, a great uh, week. And please join us next Sunday as we talk about uh, protecting uh, against uh, taxes and, and some of the things that the government can throw us. So again, Chris Berry, join us on the Chris Berry Show next Sunday at 2 p.m. Thank you. Learn more about Chris Berry and the Elder Care Firm by visiting online at michiganestateplanning.com. That's michiganestateplanning.com. You can also call Chris Berry at 888-390-4360. 888-390-4360. This program content reflects the opinions of Chris Berry and his guests, not the Elder Care Firm, Prosperity Capital Advisors, or the C.J. Berry Group, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal or tax strategy. There's no guarantee that the strategist's statements, opinions, or forecast provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There's no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs. This program is furnished by the Elder Care Firm. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm, like Jennifer did from Howell. This past summer, my mom had to transition into a nursing home, so we contacted Chris to help get things in order. You know, I wanted the best. I wanted somebody who knew what they were doing. Chris was able to help save a lot of that money that my mom and dad both worked so hard for. I thought that everything would have to go to the nursing home, but it didn't. He was able to save us half of everything that would have gone if we hadn't contacted the elder care firm. Uh, And we're all happy about that. Don't go to the nursing home without contacting Chris first. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The elder care firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. 810-214-3800.